You're listening to Conversations That Matter with your host, Terry Conrad. So welcome to Conversations That Matter. This is for people who are living on purpose. We're having very purposeful conversations. And this is literally one of our very first recorded conversations that matter. (laughs) And I really want to welcome Matthew Ferrara, who is a multitude of things. And I'm going to go over almost every single one of them. Uh, But first and foremost, uh, you are a very good friend of mine. You are my mentor. I continually learn from you. And one of the big reasons that I've asked you to be my guest today is because uh, of the respect that I have for you, everything that I've learned, and for many, many other other things. And one of the things I want to do is go to your website, because I think this is really fun. Um, Okay. Meet the philosopher. Matthew, so one of the ways that I know you is as a philosopher, of course, and and a speaker, and a writer, and a capitalist, and a survivor, and a photographer, and a teacher, and a listener, and you have all these great things that describe you, and I I really, I want to take the time to sort of go through why each one of those things have been very strategically placed right there (laughs) under your picture on your homepage. (laughs) Sure. Now, that... um... That's certainly not your typical resume, you would think. Right. Uh, and uh, yeah, I did have to put a lot of thought. Actually, I, I had to decide on a few of them, whether I would even even put them out there in some ways, because some of them are really personal. And so I think that that is something, for me at least, uh, every time I hear my resume, in a sense, or my profile uh, spoken back to me, I, it, it's always kind of like hearing it the first time, even though I'm, I'm a little bit used to it now. Right. And so right. let's let's touch on a couple. So first of all, I, I met you because you were doing some sales training down at Coldwell Banker Bain in Seattle. Mm-hmm. And you are, you know, well-versed. You've been in the real estate industry speaking and doing training, particularly in the sales and technology and marketing side of, of the business. And well-revered, huge industry leader. Um, doing a lot of speaking now, like big stage speaking, mm-hmm. a lot of leadership style of speaking, which I, I love. Of course, that's a subject that we could dive deep into. <laughs> but let's go back to um, one of my favorite things that you talk about is being a philosopher. And I, I certainly have picked up on that in our time that we've known each other. Um, you draw on a lot of uh, old philosophies, but you also are, I would say, creating a lot of your new philosophies yourself. And uh, why don't we go into some of like, what is that passion around philosophy? Well, you know, the funny thing is, like many things in life, you don't actually set out to be a philosopher. I I actually set out to be a chemist, believe it or not. That that was my original goal in high school. And uh, I love chemistry. I hate math. So uh, I had a really good college, high school counselor for college who said, you're never going to be a chemist because you can't, <laughs> you can't do the math. Yeah. Um, you, you need to do something else. And, right. and so, you know, when you get kicked out of your dream degree, if you will, you start looking around. And I was really lucky enough to go to a school where there was a real philosophy department. I graduated Phillips Academy and over. I mean, there was a real department with multiple teachers. And it really sort of unlocked that thinking side, um, which ironically enough was the part I really liked about chemistry. I liked the thinking part about chemistry, not the, not the math or the computer part about it. And so, so yeah, my degree is actually in philosophy, although I also have a degree in political science uh, and a minor in economics. Uh, and of course, all those things are lots of things. What is, you know, philosophy? Right. What is political science? What is economics? There's, there's 20 studies in each one of those. Right. And, uh, and, so and so do you so, have a favorite? Like, do you have, because I'm, I'm going to have to drop this in at some point, so I might as well drop it in now. So we have a shared fascination with Ayn Rand, which sort of yes. speaks to the capitalist side of you as well. Sure, <laughs> yeah. sure. Well, you know, Rand is a really special philosopher for me. Uh, I did, um, you know, four years of philosophy at school and uh, university and never really, I, you know, there were always these little pieces that were coming together and nothing really clicked. And I had amazing philosophy teachers and amazing political science teachers. But for four years in two departments in a very large university, no one ever mentioned her name. And uh, the year I graduated, I actually found myself in Italy sitting, just reading a bunch of books. And, 
you know, one of them was actually a book a friend had recommended to me about eight years earlier, believe it or not, that I never got around to reading. And I just, it's called The Virtue of Selfishness. Yeah. And it's a tiny book that just changes your entire life. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a fascinating experience when suddenly things start clicking, like almost like a mental chiropractic. You're like, wow, wait, suddenly things make sense. They're explainable. They're understandable. The world is not a bunch of misty, weird shadows <laughs> that all these other philosophers want you to think it is and feel it disempowered as a result of it. And uh, so one thing le leads to another, and I read literally almost every work that she has in about a 12 to 15 month period. And as I stayed in contact with my teachers from university, you know, the first time I went back to have a, have a coffee and a cigarette with them, and I said, you know, I'm just curious, how come we never, you know, studied Rand on either side of the equation, politics or um, philosophy. And it was as if you had spoken like some secret formula. <laughs> Everybody shut up and turned around and walked away. And I kind of like the renegade element to it in a lot of ways, but it really does, ex to me, explain the world. It gives me a really grasp, a powerful grasp on, you know, you talk about things that matter. Uh, yep. uh, you know, politics comes last, believe it or not. There are four or five other real studies of the universe that come first. You know, your theory of knowledge and your theory of morality and ethical choices. And so, you know, people will 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 say, wow, you did political science. But to me, unless you know all the backstory, if you will, then political science doesn't mean anything. And this is true even in my work, you know, when when I talk to people who want to make a decision about something, I say, well, let's start with the backstory. What What's the what's the what are the premises that you're that you're taking for granted that you're not even sure you're taking for granted? What would be true if we accept one decision over another? Uh, you know, they they like to say that philosophy is a sort of dead study. But to be honest, it's alive in every one of us. Every decision and choice we make is a philosophical one. I love that. But we don't discuss philosophy as a subject right. ever. It just right. never comes out. And that might be one of the reasons that I just adore listening to you speak and reading so much of your writing because I, I think you really do sort of open up that, that very closed space. And I'm, you know, the Ayn Rand thing we definitely bonded over because my <laughs> father was a deep, uh, a deep love of Ayn Rand as well. And the idea that selfishness is a is a is a good thing. She was so ahead of her time. I mean, there was just nobody right. talking like that, especially a woman. For a woman right. to have been so, you know, um, outspoken and 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 completely derailing off of every other thing. I think that's a good point. And actually, believe it or not, I find a lot of women really find. Uh, Rand very empowering. Very. Uh, my wife uh, loves Rand. Uh, we, you know, in fact, we were both reading uh, Atlas Shrugged at the very same time, which was, you know, again a weird moment in our lives uh, to have that happen after almost all of your primary learning was supposed to have occurred, and then really to have just a handful of books kind of put things in place. Um, I, I know a lot of women who, especially in the business world, are are very um, big Rand readers. You know, Carly Fiorina is a you know one of the most successful women in business um, and in politics to some extent. I mean, she didn't win her last election, but still quite you know quite uh, prestigious. And uh, you know, it's funny she's also has a degree in philosophy. Really. And uh, so you know, it's it's as you look around as a philosopher, you start to see other people who have degrees in philosophy, because people always say, well, what are you going to do with that? It, it's almost worse, and, and, and I say this in a sense of like, you know how people throw away certain uh, professions, like, well, what are you going to do with that study? Just be a teacher or whatever? Yeah, well, yeah. well, what are you going to do with philosophy? It's almost like you can't do anything because nobody goes to philosophy classes. Yes. But, you know, life is a philosophy class every day. The most exciting thing I get to do now is give my card to people on the airplane. And in fact, this week's blog will, will have a story around that where I handed a card to a guy and it just has my name on it. It says Matthew Ferrara, philosopher. And, and he looked at me as if he was seeing like a unicorn <laughs> or something, you know? And he's like, wait, wait, um, aren't you all dead? Yeah. And, and I said, well, well, not yet, you know, but, uh, and it's fascinating because people say, well, what is it that you do? And, you know, I make a, I make a living, I make a life 
out of thinking. That's what I do. I think about things a little bit more maybe than other people, sometimes maybe too much, but that's what I do. I think for a living. I love it. And, and, and of course, this is what I admire so much um, because I do think, and we've talked about this at, at length before in the past about, um, and maybe it's, maybe it's that we're just, there's no bandwidth. We're so, everyone's so busy. And maybe that's why there's a living for you as a thinker, because <laughs> everyone else needs somebody yeah. else to be doing the filtering and the, you know, what you call throwing spaghetti at the wall and trying on different ideas. And right. maybe we're all just too busy to actually do that for ourselves. And that's why there's room for people like you to come in and, and direct companies. I think that that's, I think that's a really um, common uh, scenario. And I think it's a, it's a really good observation because when you think about it, um, we are pretty much in an on-demand uh, world today. Everybody wants to know what you think now, right away. Uh, if you can't tell me, tweet it. If you can't tweet it, text it. And what's ironic about that, and it's not even just modern, it's, it's not just a modern phenomenon. This is something that really is the modern age, if you will. Yes. Uh, I'm supposed to make a decision uh, that might affect my life in, in the political arena oh, oh, based on, what, 1,500 words in a newspaper article? It doesn't matter whether it's a newspaper or Twitter. The question always has been, what's the rest of the story, if you will? Yes. What else isn't being spoken, what's being taken for granted. Um, and you're right, in the modern day, we have a little less time for reflection. Uh, I have this kind of rule, this, this cardinal rule, if you will, uh, that I have to work at, just like everybody else. But in the morning, I try to spend at least a half an hour before touching uh, any, you know, inputs, yes. uh, TV, radio, uh, social media. And it's hard. It's really, really hard. I mean, I had to actually build an exercise around it, you know, get up, go out, water the tomatoes, <laughs> you know, those kinds of things, you know, like play with the backyard for half an hour so that your brain has a chance to do reflective thinking and i don't think i don't think that we give ourselves enough time but i always know that people love when they have time to reflect yes. they jump out of the shower with an idea and they only had five minutes to reflect imagine if they gave themselves an hour or a day or a week it would be really powerful so i love that because i have a bunch of people in my world that are really pushing meditation on me <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I so want to love the idea of meditation. <laughs> I really, really do. I right. believe it would be healthy, but I'm right. just not that girl, right? Yeah. And I still think that I, I've often thought that when I'm doing my walk, right, if I take my 30 minutes to go do sort of a power walk in nature, I'm combining my spiritual side, <laughs> my nature side, and my and my reflection side. So I love that. I'm going to use well, that. and and not all meditation is just locking yourself in a quiet room. Yeah, uh, I do it. You know, some meditation is done through song and some meditation is done through, uh, you know, uh, repeating some words or uh, dance as a form of meditation. I think what what they mean by meditation, you know, in general is just a chance to just be there with yourself in the moment um, and to give yourself permission not to have to be communicating to anyone else but yourself. I, I think. agree. I think it's that, it's that mental break and yeah. allowing space, just like quieting the mind enough to allow for other things right. to sort of occur. I, I think, think that's, that's true. Yeah. Anyway, so, okay, so back to um, philosophy now. To really throw a corkscrew in the whole, what an amazing <laughs> philosopher you are, there's this other side of you that is Star trek -y, Yeah, sure. Which I think also ties in. Well, I mean, science fiction is in and of itself a kind of philosophy, right? It's a view of the future. Uh, it makes certain assumptions about human nature. The best science fiction stories are still good versus evil, good guy versus bad guy, uh, where mostly the good guys still win, which is 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 still good news, I guess. Uh, but. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, look, the science. My love of science fiction is partially a love of believing that the future is going to turn out all right, that people are going to create some really cool and amazing things that help uh, us live really good lives. Right. Uh, but also, I think it's, um, in a sense, my love of science fiction is also a love of writing because most science fiction writers and fantasy writers are just really really great writers they just have to they have to work in a world that doesn't even exist and right. so they have to create it 
Yeah. Um, and, you know, in a way, that's that's philosophy, trying to imagine a better world, a better way of living or a better way of getting something done is is that kind of same thing. Uh, and though we might not have all of the crazy technologies, uh, I think at the same time, it starts with the imagination. We imagine those things and then maybe we're able to uh, cre create the same outcomes, even though we don't have all the fantastic uh, devices, for example. No kidding, which is, a, which is an amazing gift, which not everybody has, but you are a very, very talented writer, and you just did a trip to Italy, which was, I believe, was that a creative writing course? Yes, uh, it's the second year that we've done this. Uh, the last year, I went to this creative writing course that uh, was an opportunity just to, you know, be in a farmhouse in uh, north of Florence with 10 or 12 other people with no internet access, pens, papers, reading some good writing, talking about good writing, and practicing good writing and sharing it with each other. And I had so much fun doing it last year. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm a terrible student. I truly am, <laughs> uh, which, which is probably not a surprise to anyone. But so I'm always a student leader, if you will. Yep. And as a result of last year, they asked me if I would come do some presentation this year as well. So this year I was like a, a hybrid doing some creative writing. And what happened was really quite amazing. Um, last year I changed how I, I really did have an impact on how I wrote. Um, up until then, I would say I was a rather um, sort of uh, um, uh, fact-based writer, yes. you know, try to lay out all the arguments and make a convincing close. And last year, you know, creative writing is about writing stories that people can associate with. In the last year, almost all of my writing has become more stories, personal stories, situational stories. And to be honest with you, my readers seem to have really gone crazy for it which is a it. big surprise to me it's very validating but at the same time it's far more fun to write in that space so one you wrote last uh last august actually so almost a year ago was pursue happiness to attract success right uh and this was one of my favorites um because you were talking about seeking happiness and then the success will follow if and as a philosophy so right. I, I wondered if we might sort of play with that idea a little bit and what what spurred you to write that post well you know i've spent 25 years helping people pursue success that's right. you know from a professional standpoint and a lot of it has been best practices skills techniques but at the end of the day no matter how many tools or techniques you have a lot of people actually don't become successful because deep down they're not very happy about either their job or something else. Something else is going on in their life. And, and I'm not a psychologist, you know, like I, I don't put my readers on the black couch and say, <laughs> let me fix all of your problems. Yeah. I just talk about what's kind of happened to me. And uh, I use my own story, and if it relates to some, and it, it works well. Um, what I've what I've discovered in my life, and what I see in a lot of successful people is they're all incredibly happy people first yes and then they seem to attract the elements of success and 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 it's not just business success like other successes maybe they're running a you know an organization that's doing something charitable in their community or maybe the success is as simple as helping one person you know they're working with a veteran or a child or whatever that thing is mm -hmm. and 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 sometimes the success is a personal success so they finally master the piano or finally you know, write that book that they wanted to write. But it had to start by really evaluating whether what they were doing was making them happy and how they were thinking was making them happy first. And then it's really kind of magnetic. You know, the happier you are, I think it's very magnetic. The more you attract the conditions of success, um, and I've seen a lot of people with a lot of tools who never go anywhere, mm -hmm. and I've seen a lot of people with no tools, yep. no money, no time, no technology, no skills, mm -hmm. but they're just really happy with whatever they're doing, and the rest kind of follows. And so for me, it was like a bit of a contrarian flip, you know, like yep. let's, not, let's not wait until we become rich and, su and successful to then say we're happy. Right. Why don't we just wake up every day and look around and decide what we're happy about and success comes. And some of that comes also from our personal experiences, you know, like for some of us, 
getting up every day is enough to make you <laughs> happy. Just getting up every day. Oh, I day. thought that's the success part, just getting up. <laughs> and it's successful too, right? Yeah. So, so, you know, I, 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 this was this, this writing, this piece was a, was definitely a result of learning to tell stories mm -hmm. and uh, to tell those stories better. And what's so funny is that, uh, you know, on reflection, people would come up to me years later after seeing me on stage and say, oh, I, you know, I, I saw you in, in 2001 in Atlanta, Georgia, and I loved your story of whatever. Right. They could never remember a fact or a figure or whether I told them to do this or some other speaker told them to do that, but none of them ever forgot a story that made them laugh or cry or think or whatever. And so I, I was always a little bit of a storyteller, but last year I really took up the I took up the mantle of, of being a good storyteller. And ironically this year, um, my my push from my fellow writers is to write mystery stories. For some reason, yes, for some reason they, they think I'm going to be good at writing mystery stories. So I've actually started uh, uh, penning uh, some, some, some mystery stories. Uh, and again, what, what is the point? I, I don't know yet, but maybe the practice of writing mysteries will help me solve some something else that Absolutely. I'm working on. Well, you that know, would be like a puzzle, right? So, and I can, yeah. you the, the ultimate thinker, I can see that being very fun for you. Well, what's weird about mysteries is, so I love reading mysteries because you love to know who did it, what happened, right. et cetera. Writing mysteries is very hard because you actually have to figure out who did it and then tell the story in such a way that people don't know who did it, if you will. And so it's actually quite harder for me because I almost want the story to unfold without knowing who will do it until I write that portion. Right, right, right. <laughs> who knows if that's even possible, but it is, it is a just, it's a different way of thinking. And that's, of course, one of the wonderful things for me, at least. I'm perfectly open to thinking about other ways of thinking. I, well, I, I find that a fascinating process because I would think, particularly working with brokerages, for instance, if you're walking into a brokerage and you're trying to help them solve some internal problems, you know, figuring out, well, what is the end game that we want to achieve and then reverse engineering that would be sort of the same kind of process. Well, you know, the ironic thing is that most people don't start there. So most people will hire someone, a consultant, a speaker, a trainer, or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, and they'll come in and they'll tell them what the problem is. Right. And they will tell them what the desired outcome is, right. but they don't do the rest of the work. Great, great, great consultants you know, I use the term broadly, right? But whether you're a consultant through speaking or whatever it is, sure. um, you're all detectives. You've got to find out the rest of the story. Yeah. I mean, I'll just give you a really quick example. Um, uh, you know, during the downturn in the housing market, we mm -hmm. worked with a real estate broker who was just losing money, hand yeah. over fist, had three offices. One was losing more money than others. Mm -hmm. And so logically, and other consultants told him, listen, you, you have to close that office, but he refused to do it until someone did some detective work. And after having lunch with him, I discovered, well, the reason he's not closing the third office is he has three sons. Oh. He promised all three sons an office, you yeah. know? Yeah. Now, further detective work turns out the son who's running that office doesn't want doesn't to even want it. <laughs> be in the business and run the office, which is, of course, possibly why it's not doing so well. Yeah. But again, going in and just solving the problem, I have a financial crisis, what do I do, yes. is, is not really it. It's, it's uh, what, what are the premises of this crisis? Where do they come from? This is philosophy. This is detective work. Um, and this is the fun stuff. And when I get to speak, sometimes just to engineer experience like that mm -hmm. in someone's mind for mm -hmm. an hour is really rewarding. It's like giving them a mystery. If well, you the will. fact that you use the term engineer, I think it, yes. it speaks a lot to your personality, <laughs> Mr. Puppet Strings. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, you, you do have to really create the right conditions for an aha moment. And uh, I could tell someone a thousand times something, but if I can get them to realize it on their own, if I can engineer that moment yes. where they step over the line themselves. Yes. It's good. It's it's more far more powerful. Well, and they we do that in coaching too. Like they say, you can tell somebody what to do, or you can lead them to discover the answers for themselves, which yes. is always going to be you know so much more powerful. Yes. Yeah. So that's the trick. 
Yes, and you know what the irony is, is that that, that works beautifully one-on-one, -on -one and it works beautifully in, in business, for example. Ironically, we don't apply that in the rest of the world today. Like, when was the last time you saw a politician go on the, on the television on a Sunday and say, we're facing this problem, and here are three things we could do, mm -hmm. and here are three things that would result if we did them. Right. And... I'm just going to leave now. Like I'm not, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to make a decision. Yeah. I'm going to let people think about those Percolate. decisions. Yeah. Right now to on some degree, maybe, you know, we could argue that people don't want that in the world of politics. Like politics is actually an area that people just really would wish they didn't have to deal with, believe it or not. Yes. But on the other hand, they're never happy. They're never, people are never, I, I rarely hear anyone who's ecstatic about the political decisions in their country. And that's because they're also not thinking through the decisions they're being told to make. I, you know, politics is a, is a sticky area, but I've always, I've always felt, and I have an actual fascination with the, with the idea of politics. Right. Um, but at the same time, it's like, are we, did politics just attract a certain type of people but I've always felt that you know whoever ends up in politics and people are like ragging on them for making so much money I, I figure you know what mm. they I think they kind of earn it I think yeah. they kind of earn that money because they work really hard they're on stage all the freaking time their life sure. is not their own for the entire time that they are in office right. and you know their hands are very tied they're you know towing to party line most of the time everything that their idealistic self who was running the campaign wanted to do probably learned <laughs> not quickly after they the were reality they were, yeah politics. exactly so yeah. i you know anyway we can that's a whole other conversation well but you know but just just along those lines of thoughts i mean think about all the things that you, we took for granted just in that conversation you know like it's taken for granted that for some reason politicians shouldn't make money i know like why why yeah, we want doctors to make money. We want lawyers to make money. You know, so 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 it's a premise we've never challenged, right? We've yeah. never challenged that. I'd rather have successful people as politicians mm -hmm. than unsuccessful people as politicians. I think I'd rather a have strong argument there, right? Yeah. Who's made some money by working hard, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. um, or or the other thing is, you know, we we say things like, well, they're stuck. Politicians are stuck. Well, maybe we want them to be stuck. Maybe that's a good thing: is yeah. to have stuck politicians. Because, you know, a less active politician may be the right kind of politician right. that right. we want. But none of those conversations, we never get to those conversations. We never get to, you know, what, what do we want in a po politician because we're simply trapped into um, talking about outcomes rather than talking about the process or the background story. Oh, so you've just touched a theme that's like big for me this year. I, I have been uber sensitive to the fact that we are so outcome focused yeah. lately. This is just on my radar lately. Sure. And I would love to dig into that a little bit if you don't mind, just because, um, you know, why is that, do you think? I mean, I have my ideas. But well, I'm why do you think? Because I'm, I'm curious, you know, this is obviously when you think about people measuring everything by outcomes, it doesn't come out of a vacuum. So, well, I mean, I, th I think you've touched on another point, which is, you know, we, we measure everything. And so we are very metrics focused, um, mm -hmm. which I know, like, so look, I did Weight Watchers, you track your calories. Like, that's, <laughs> you, can't, you can't know how well you're doing unless right. you measure. So I understand the need for metrics. Having right. said that, um, you know, I, it was, I think it was Bobby Kennedy, and I wrote a post about this uh, a year or so ago, Bobby Kennedy did a speech at one of the universities and it laid out what, um, you know, the GDP and its value, but how it doesn't actually track, you know, the character of a man or the value of a family or, you know, all these, in, you know, non-tangible things that clearly we value, but nobody's measuring those. And, and you and I, I think you and I had had this conversation before, and I think you even wrote another post about, you know, measuring the ROI of your mom. Yeah, I, I mean, look, uh, there are some things that need to be measured by a different standard. Right. Right. But, so, but that's not being measured, not at, not at least in these conversations. Well, think of it like this. I think it's important to evaluate. I think I just use that as, as an anti-measurement term, if you will. But evaluate or assess or being critical or judging is important because you never sure. know what's good or bad, right or wrong if you, if you didn't do that. Right. But, but some things are measured incorrectly in our life. So I remember an article I once wrote called, What's Your Mother's Clout Score? I think you know? that's the one, yeah. 
Yeah, like, like, you know, you would never say my mom has as much clout as Justin Bieber or something, you know? <laughs> my mom could say one thing and could radically alter my day, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, and she could have growing up and she will in the future. And, you know, and I think that so when we think about influence or judging something, you know, would we rank a Monet on a scale of one to 10? You know, it doesn't make any sense. We measure it on different things and yes. how it makes us feel, what it makes us think of. Of, et cetera. Now, I think this is true um, in so many areas, like art, aesthetics, mm -hmm. um, uh, y you know, even, um, you know, spiritual matters, if you will. Mm -hmm. But I think when it comes to business, for example, yeah. everybody thinks of quantification. Yes. And and I think that's a I think that's unfortunate to some degree. Um, I think that there are a lot of things that are measured by a thank you note. They're measured by a customer giving you a hug. You know, mm -hmm. I, I here's a very simple example. I just recently uh, went to a hotel in uh, Virginia, and uh, I got to the hotel and there was a lady literally in the foyer. Who's, she had her arms on. She's like, welcome to our hotel. We are awesome. so happy to see you. And her arms are open. So what do you do when you see you, with her arms open? You, you hug them, right? Yeah. So I literally gave her a hug and she gave me a hug. And then, you know, I went on to the desk and she gave the next guy a hug. And I'm like, wait a minute. Like, <laughs> how do I yelp that? How do, yeah. is that four stars? Is that seven stars? Like, <laughs> It's meaningless. What's meaningful is that someone absolutely made the end of my day and created a powerful um, moment mm -hmm. that I will never forget, that I will talk about. Yep. Um, and that's an outcome, you know, in terms of where will I ever stay again if I go there? Where will I recommend people to say It has business outcomes if you want. So I think we have to be um, at least a little more forgiving with the concept of being outcome measured focused as opposed to just outcome focused like Agreed. what would we want to have happen and what are the ways we could make that happen that aren't just driven through a, a, a spreadsheet if you will i completely agree and i don't and i think they can be connected like i think you can say sure. you know like obviously if you continue to send business in that direction there is an outcome Absolutely. that can be measured on a on a sheet but they won't be able to track that back to that hug right Right. And I do think that's that's a challenge in a sense. Mm -hmm. But if the outcome you're getting is a result of some things you can observe, like if you observe that business picks up in the 12 months after the hug campaign began, or the, let's just yeah. call it the greeting campaign, yeah. just greeting you. How many hotels have you been to where they don't greet you? They just kind of like, you know, last name, please, mm -hmm. you know, credit card, please. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want the, you know, what newspaper do you want? It's very mechanical and you're like processed as if you were a trash can, right? Yes. Yep. And so if you could measure some uptick in something as yep. a result of the door greeting campaign, then that's as much of a spreadsheet as anything else. You know, maybe time is the measurement in that case, right. as opposed to repeat dollars or repeat stays. Maybe, maybe it's a different thing that we can measure measure, which is the time spent doing this activity versus the time we weren't spending or stopped doing that activity. I love that. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a million ways we can sort of suggest how people could use that, especially in real estate. This, And by the way, Conversations That Matter isn't just for real estate people. This is for, sure. but real estate people are people too. Like, so <laughs> I, I like to give them some love as well. So well, you know what's so funny though, is like when you think about it, um, it, it, it really, it, um, that lady in the, in the hotel has the same problem that every business person has, yes. right? Yeah. She, she, she has the same pr problem people have when they visit a real estate agent's office or you visit your dentist's office. Um, I just moved across the country and the experience of getting, you know, I had to get a new doctor, a new barber. I know it doesn't look like it. But like, <laughs> you know, I had to get all these new things and each one was an opportunity to re-experience. Right a greeting, you know, because I'd had the same doctor for 19 years. I'd had the same, you know, barber for seven years. So yep. it was very interesting to have a chance to do that fresh again. And there are the same problems 
everywhere you go. It doesn't right. matter what industry. Yeah. And so you moved from Boston to yes. Vegas. To Las Vegas. What was the driving factor? What better that? place to practice philosophy than well, Las I, Vegas? I completely <laughs> agree. <laughs> well, no, I mean, there's a number of fun factors. One is this is clearly the convention capital of the universe. Yep. Um, and I would say, you know, most of my day is spent either writing or speaking. And so there was a business element here. Uh, there was an element of, of adventure, you know, yeah. something really different than Boston, that's for sure. Um, uh, you know, also being able to listen to signals. You know, there were signals uh, back in our life in Boston. I, I used to have a very, very large company, 50 plus employees, you know, thousands of square feet of office space, et cetera. Um, and over the last few years, we took steps to sell some of that, close some of that, make different changes. And so, you know, life was lining things up. Yep for something to happen. Um, and then there were other pushes and signals, uh, one of which was just a different pace of life. Well, Las Vegas, I mean, we don't live on the Strip, right? We live in a normal neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. um, but Las Vegas is a very different pace of life. Uh, you know, people drive fast, but they're, you know, when, when you're in a coffee shop, they hold the door open for you. Right. Uh, people will spend hours at the dinner table uh, in a restaurant or something. Like, it's very, very... Um, chill, if you will, here in some ways. And I and I, I think we needed that. And to be really frank, it's sunny here every I day. Know, it's just I know. sunny. It's so and it is a different experience living in a place where it's always sunny. How has that affected your, you know, like your overall state of happiness? No question about it. Two things it's it's done for sure. One is I don't look out the um, the window in the morning and say, what's the weather? And then, because that could change your whole day. Yes. Oh, it's raining. We're not going bicycle riding or yes. picnic or whatever. That's a bummer. So it's always sunny no matter what. I mean, it does get hot, so you plan for that. Mm -hmm. But the second thing is this. Um, Las Vegas is actually, the desert is actually awake 24 hours a day because during the day things are awake. Right. But at night, all the animals come out because it's too hot in the daytime for them to come out. Right. So the nighttime is very alive. If you go for a walk at night, everything's out. Like all the birds are out and it's chirping and it's a very different space. Interesting. And so I know this sounds really weird, but in a way, it's like a little bit more alive than the day-night cycle that I was living in before. So, yeah, it's it's a fascinating experience in some ways. That's really so cool. That's so cool. Um, yeah. I, I, I know. I actually like I like your patio. I could come work there <laughs> every day. Yeah, um, it's a good place to work, isn't it? There was another um, subject that crossed my radar with you uh, a while back, and, I, and I'm hoping you can remember more about it because you touched on uh, the need for a renaissance. I believe mm. you were calling for a renaissance, and I, yeah, I sure. just the, the word just woke me up, and I'm like, this is <laughs> awesome. I want to dig into that a little bit. Sure. Where were you coming from on that? Well, the phrase is actually coined from a really important mentor of mine. Um, I lived in Italy for a little while, 20-something years ago, and I lived with a family that was a bit of a Renaissance family. Uh, the father was an architect. The brother was a musician. The son, the, the other brother was um, kind of a chemist. And, uh, um, and the mother was a, a student of Jung, actually taught yoga and psychosynthesis. Kind of a Renaissance um, family in a lot of ways, and I was their Renaissance, you know, American son for sure. a year or so, a year and a half. And um, what was interesting to me was this constant, you know, you live in the in Italy, which is you know a product of many eras, but the most the most vibrant era was the Renaissance, um, and yet Italy is not a Renaissance country these days you know right. there's a lot about it that's not as much so this term came up from the mother who kind of coined it as you know your i was kind of a renaissance man a little of everything you know the guy who writes who speaks who you know knows a little photography knows a little chemistry a little you know a renaissance guy a, a franklin um but even franklin was not in the renaissance but for me the concept is a little bit um analogous to what i think we need in the world today and that is a, a, re, a revolution a rebirth of a certain way of thinking um a, a way of thinking that is thought through, mm -hmm. that is um, thought out, mm -hmm. uh, a way that goes back and says, well, 
you know, we're not going to forget about history. History is the basis of any progress that we will make, any mistakes we will avoid and things we will do more of. Um, and the Renaissance was also a time where all bets were off. You know, people did things in the Renaissance they were not allowed to do in the Dark Ages. Right. You know, they started doing autopsies on bodies, which they could not do, you know, and they could learn about anatomy, which led to modern health. They, the, you know, sciences were freed up so that we could experiment and lead to, you know, airplanes and combustion engines and modern you know, right. uh, transportation, et cetera. So I think that that, follow, that that concept of a sort of rebirth, if you will, of some ways of thinking, not what to think. I, I'm, I'm not, you know, saying, oh, we have to go back to, you know, 14th century thought or something, mm -hmm. but how they thought things through. They were all inquisitive. They were willing to make uh, mistakes, take risks. And there is a lot of that going on in the world right. today. Uh, yep. There really is which is exciting, but there's also a lot that's very heavy. There's a kind of, right now I would say we're kind of at this point, you know, historically, not this year, but over a period of years, where it's kind of like, well, we could tip back into a dark ages, if you will, right. or we could tip forward into a new renaissance of even greater growth in the sciences and humanities and commerce and art, et cetera. So the question is, is how did you come to that determination? Like, what, what do you think, what are you seeing that you call so heavy? Well, what's so interesting to me is, uh, you know, I'm a child of the 80s, right? Mm -hmm. So in 1989, these amazing things happened. The Cold War ended, the yes. Berlin Wall yes. fell, uh, you know, the space shuttle was going up every week. Yep. Uh, you know, we were making progress on serious illnesses and yeah. people around the world were addressing clean water. You know, there's a lot of different things going on that seemed really positive in the 80s. Yes. Yeah. And then the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, and then the 2000s. Now, it's, you know, that's almost kind of like, well, it's just 10 years in time mm -hmm. or 20 years in time. But to be honest with you, from my perspective, a lot of the things, a lot of the mistakes that we're making, you know, you could change the date, the time and the names. And we made these mistakes in 1935 or we right. made these mistakes in 1855 or when we made these mistakes in et cetera. So in a lot of ways, I feel like sort of the bad history is repeating itself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we're getting a lot of really bad outcomes now again i'm i am naturally optimistic about the universe mm -hmm. i am always optimistic that things will work out in a way that i will never anticipate that the universe is unfolding the way it should whether right. i know it or not yep. so i'm a naturally optimistic guy but i also see that we make a lot of our own problems and we make them a lot worse and that is to me the sort of dark possibility, if you will, that we, if we don't talk about it, we can't avoid it. Oh, I love that. And I think, I think maybe we can streamline uh, corrections a lot sooner if we're cognizant of the mistakes that have been made for sure. But sure. don't you also think that there's sort of this, you know, this cyclical wave, like, I mean, if we go up high enough and look back over the timeline of history, yeah. you can sort of start to see the pattern of it going um, and that this, at some point, you know, there's recovery. Every time there's a dip, there's a recovery. It's it just the yeah. same in the same in the market, you know, today in real estate market yeah. is the same. Yes and no. I mean, so again, having the ability to look back over long periods of time, if you really think about it, um, you know, how someone lived in 200 AD and how someone lived in 1000 AD, not significantly different right. over 800 years, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, if we fast forward all the way up to, say, 1770 or 1800, mm -hmm. you know, we're starting to see some significant changes, but still not a lot different. You know, someone like Isaac Newton, for example, um, never, wa never went further than approximately 20 miles from where he was born. Wow, yeah, crazy. Next week, I'll fly to China. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> yeah, but you so can't there, sit still. <laughs> no, right. But, but clearly, there's been a lot of, of changes, if you will. But for a long time, there wasn't. And then we have this really powerful period from the Renaissance through the Industrial Revolution to today. Right. Now, it's true that there are a lot of crises and we always seem to eventually bounce back. Yeah. And, that, and, that, and that's true. However, we have more crises more frequently and we live in an era where it may be harder to bounce back from. Look, if, if it's one thing to bounce back, if, if it's 1600 and all the crops fail, well, the only way to bounce back is that the crops don't fail next, next year, year, right? Yeah. 
Right. Well, it's a little different in the modern world today. Things could bounce in such a way. The global uh, financial system could bounce in such a way. Uh, 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 you know, uh, atomic weapons are, you know, are maybe on more on the loose than ever before. There's right. a lot of things from which we may not exactly bounce back. Right, if right, you, right. Know. you know, think about it like this. In the United States, we eradicated polio yeah. 25 years ago. And yet suddenly we're fighting polio again. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. we, we virtually drove tuberculosis out of existence in yeah. the United States. Now we're fighting tuberculosis again. Right. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a generation that was the last generation to worry about measles and mumps. Now we're worried about measles and mumps again. And there's and, and again, I'm just I'm pulling random ideas that, you know, that those are health issues. Mm -hmm. Right. Those are health issues. Mm -hmm. But there are other issues out there. Overall, other issues out there, um, whether it is. Uh, in commerce or in just the, you know, the way that we communicate with each other or right. in the way that uh, we express ourselves, you know, that we've, we've, the, these crises do come a little quicker, yep. a little more severe, and they are a little bit harder to dig out of every single time. And so as a result, I just think it's, it's not just going to be a historical pattern. I do, I don't believe in the end of history. I don't believe in that concept, but I do believe that it is possible to repeat serious, serious mistakes in history. You know, as they as they used to say, the Dark Ages were dark on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. the Dark Ages yeah. were dark on purpose, and so there's a lot of thought going into creating the Dark Ages back when we had them. Right. And so we could be, you know, experiencing that thought again. That would be a cycle we would not want to to repeat. What's well, interesting? I mean. You know, and I we could go on and on and on and on, and I kind of want to cut it a little bit short here. But um, the one thing that I wanted to sort of tag on to that is this, you know, in this connected world, mm. um, you would think the opportunity would be to eradicate that, to eliminate any possibility that we would be so connected and the communication yeah. would be so open and that we would be, you know, so collaborative in our efforts. Well, you know, you have to forgive me. I don't remember who said the quote, and I'm sure everyone who watches this will Google it right away. But I think the quote goes something along the lines of, we wanted flying cars, but we got 140 characters instead. Right. You know, so we want the future <laughs> was a future of flying cars. We were going to have yeah. flying cars, yeah. right? Yeah. And we got Twitter. Yeah. Um, one in six minutes is spent on Facebook. Millions of billions of tweets a month, a year, et cetera. Um, so, so here's a great example of Renaissance thinking. If we've mobilized, let's just say roughly one and a half billion people in the world. Yes. Say we've mobilized them. Yes. No one has asked the question, what for? So if we've mobilized them, for more click advertising, yeah. I think there's something something wrong with that, right? It is ringing a little hollow. Like, there's no question. They, I, I, there's so much push for content. It's getting so noisy. Everyone's trying to sell and step on each other's heads to get the attention. And, and, it, and I am asking myself, you know, what are we doing? Right. Why are we doing it? But imagine if billions of people, imagine if just 100 million people who are online right now, mm -hmm. we're having a conversation not about something on a cutesy video right. or an Instagram photo. They were in a conversation about, you know, what's a better way to organize transportation or what's an easier way to ensure people have access to water or what's a better way to solve the unemployment problems in the West today? Like, it's, that's the kind of thing I think, you know, to me, I'm sort of like, what, what for? What, what is, what, what do you, you mobilize all these people, but if it's just to buy more washing powder and soap and, and, and string, it just, it doesn't make any sense to me in some ways. And that one is a big one. Mm. And we will have to have a whole other conversation on that one. <laughs> sure, Because sure. that, I actually think that really is a conversation that matters. Not enough people are having those deeper, more meaningful conversations that actually might lead to positive change. I do think right that needs to be facilitated so. and cool things are happening i mean there are like i love kickstarter yes me too you know, it's a good it's a good space where they do a lot of things and I you know think, and all the social good uh companies that are creating social movements i do think right. that there is a lot of positive we right. should we should definitely mention that quickly um uh, i think i will be seeing you at workshop in uh in december 
in Hawaii, yes. And the reason I bring that up is because <laughs> you had been asked to uh, speak or to actually to tie the whole conference. So first of all, Worth Shop, why don't you give a, a quick description of what that is? It's a, it's a really amazing event. Um, this is Worth Shop 4 this year. And um, each of the Worth Shops has been hosted by Hawaii Life yeah. in Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, they're really a fabulous um, organization. And, uh, you know, ostensibly, yes, they sell real estate, but they also, they do a lot more. They really are kind of um, a social good company in some ways. Um, last year, their Worth Shop was focused on simplicity. And that's what I love about these conferences. They always have like a simple theme, if you will. Uh, and uh, I was invited actually to do something really quite unique last year. Uh, I was invited to show up and to close, to give the closing. And uh, so I, of course, asked, well, what are the topics and who's speaking and what would you like me to speak on? Because I like to re engineer it. Well, you know, a little <laughs> preparation goes a long way. Yeah. And I, I was challenged by my friend Mark, who said, uh, well, I'm not going to tell you any of that. You're not, I'm not going to ask you to prepare anything. I just want you to come and listen and do what you do, which is listen to people talking and synthesize them and just close. And I said, well, how long should I speak? He said, start when you start and end when you end. And if you can fascinate us for four minutes or 40 minutes or four hours, we'll sit there, you know. And it was a, it was a really big carte blanche, if you will. And so I've been asked to do that again this year because it really was a, a powerful learning experience for me as well. You know, show up, no computer, no preparation, no outline, listen for two days, not just to the presentations, but to the conversations being had, pull a few strings together, put them through the kind of, you know, cotton gin of my head and weave them in with other stuff and see if you can come out with a tapestry that makes sense. Uh, I haven't been that nervous in 25 years, yeah. and I haven't been that thrilled with what I was able to get done in just, say, 20 minutes with them on, on stage. So I'll be closing again this year, and it really is powerful. People should check it out because it's a very special place this year in, in, uh, in Hawaii, and uh, there, will be, uh, there will be a limited number of seats that I think are almost uh, selling out. But it, it's a fabulous experience, and it's Hawaii. So as a result, Maui. <laughs> you know, you just get a chance to completely disconnect from the universe. It's really wonderful there. I will be there. Based on everything you told me about last year's, I yeah, it was a great it. experience. Yeah. It really was. I will for sure be there. I'm very excited now. And that's the picture behind you that you took, the photograph that I believe <laughs> is the centerpiece of that blog post where you describe that. Uh, that's Yellow Pants and oh, Pirates. Oh, Pirates one. Yes, right, that's right, the right. Yellow Pants and Pirates story. I think the article that came from Worth Shop was called Short Sleeves and Rubber Shoes. Correct, because you wore, you wore a Hawaiian shirt. I had shirt. to wear a Hawaiian <laughs> shirt. So th this is sort of Vegas wear, but, yeah. you know, make this paisley or yeah. something. And those weird rubber shoes, you know, or sandals or something. And, and, and obviously, if people are watching this, they need perspective. Just go to my website. Yeah. You know, it's three-piece suit. suits and Italian <laughs> shoes. And, yeah. you know, it's just not my normal yeah. gig. Yeah. Uh, but it was, a, it was an opportunity to break all the rules yeah. and actually teach myself something, which is once you really figure out what you're good at, if you put yourself in positions to do what you're good at yep. in your comfort zone, yep. again, this is something just different than what I've learned. Everybody wants to kick everyone out of their comfort zone. I'm actually not quite ready to do that. I'm actually ready to get people to draw out their comfort zone. Tell me what you're awesome at, and let's figure out how to position you at being awesome in that space yes. every day for a while. It doesn't mean you won't venture off a little bit and try some new things, but Hell, I don't want to be outside of my comfort zone. I want to be successful in it. That that experience taught that to me. And I actually have um, been having a lot more fun in my presentations, showing up a little less over-scripted and over-prepared and a little more like, let me throw some photos on the screen, tell you a couple of stories that relate to the issues we're talking about today, and then let's just talk. And it's really been a very powerfully fun evolution for me as well. I love it. As you know, because I'm a conversation gal, so I just think it, it, when it's just, you know, it's you talking to me and we're just sharing right. stories and, and there's room for things to sort of magic, the magic happens in that space, I think. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I think the, uh, the element for the audience is wonderful because they're part of it. 
they either recognize yes. themselves in something that I'm I'm telling them of themselves. Right. You know, maybe I'm recounting something that happened earlier that day or th almost always I can start a program these days with something that I've experienced in the last half hour in the lobby or whatever. So the audience gets excited because they're a part of that. Absolutely. But also because um, I, I do think that audiences today are pretty much up to speed on all of the ordinary answers and the ordinary suggestions. And so they are pretty excited by someone who gets on stage and says, I'm not 100% sure where this is going to go. <laughs> totally. <laughs> but if you trust me, we're going to go to a good place. Yeah. And boy, do they really love that, yeah, I think. No. It gives them permission. People come up to me afterwards sometimes and say, you know, I used to think I had to have a 30-page business plan. And I'm like, you know what? Let's just start with one page and go with that. I did this entire speech on one photo. Yeah. Let's do that. And, and, and they feel like they can be creative and successful, and they don't have to jump off the high board. They could just swim in the pool they're comfortable in for a while. I love that. Speaking yeah. of getting away from sort of outcome-focused uh, sure. directives. Yeah, love it. Love it. Matthew, uh, <laughs> thank you so, so much. Wow, my pleasure. Uh, this hour just flew by. Crazy. Um, yeah. When we do again, we can really go. And I, like, I, I'll want to do this again, of course. So sure. I want to thank you for taking your time to join us and uh, share your, your amazing, brilliant mind with <laughs> us. I think you're so creative. I think you truly are a Renaissance man. Wow. And if people want to reach out and connect with you, if they don't already know you, uh, where sure. can they find you? Well, uh, you know, they could Google me very easily, Matthew Ferrara, but MatthewFerrara.com is the best way. It's actually a little of everything, writing, schedule, photos. It's a little of everything on there. So Awesome. Yeah. Now, before I let you go, uh, there was one more thing that we have to touch. Okay. Because <laughs> at the end of every conversation that matters, I always go, or I want to go, you are literally conversation number two. So here's, you're, okay. setting, you're setting sort of the bar. But All kind right. of where I want to take things is... Um, talking a little bit about legacy and since you are a survivor mm. uh, I thought you might want to discuss briefly uh, what that experience and challenge and story and lesson has been for you and what that might mean in terms of meaning in your life I'm sure it's, it's um so I am a two-time cancer survivor I had lung cancer in 1999 and kidney cancer in 2006 um you know, the lessons from it are pretty simple in a lot of ways. You know, people, I think, I think they think that cancer patients have these huge epiphanies. Right. Um, we actually don't. We, we, mostly, <laughs> we mostly are constantly worried that little bumps and aches and pains are bigger than they are. So, right. you know, um, but that, that actually is one of the lessons, which is for me to trust that the universe is okay and that an ache or a pain is just an ache or a pain and not everything is the end of the universe. Right. Um, but the other thing, I, I think a big lesson for me was one in which I, um, I really focused more on um, meaningful work. Um, uh, you know, when you think you have a limited amount of time left, mm -hmm. and, and in fact, we all may have a limited amount of time left, mm -hmm. whether it's limited to 60 years or 60 seconds. Right. Uh, you know, it does make you ask questions like, what are you doing? And the first time I had cancer, the question was, will I be here tomorrow? And will I be able to get my career back on track? I had been in business for 10 years. Yes. But the second year I knew, the second time I knew I could get my career back on track. So I really got to the question of, well, what do I want to do with it? And actually for me, it's when a lot of changes happened. I, uh, you know, stopped some lines of work, started other lines of work, started working differently. You know, I... Um, I often just um, share an hour of work with clients around the world as opposed to uh, eight hours or you know something like that. I, I've, I've decided to have quality conversations, quality contributions, and also to make those contributions in other ways. You know, there's always another day at the office, but you know, getting involved with photography, with writing, those kinds of things. Yeah, I always had those elements in me, but having um, those moments that say, look, there might be a really limited time left to do those things gives you a little push to do it. When I talk about that with audiences, what I basically wish them is the positive outcome of the experience without having the experience. Right. You know, Don't put off a lot of things um, simply because you want to squeeze another appointment in. There's always time 
for an appointment. I could always get on another plane. Um, there may not be another time to take a good picture of the sunset or to, you know, play with your kids or whatever those things are. And so I think that that's important. I, I think that's a lesson that I try to bring in to audiences that I see who are asking me how to work more. And I actually try to spend a little time with them and invite them on how to live a little more, uh, not just work, but to live a little more. So that's those are kind of my experiences. Yeah. That's fabulous. I love it. Um, I just think we're so lucky to have you. And uh, I'm truly, truly grateful for your friendship and your mentorship. And uh, Appreciate it. And I love your philosophies. And to, well, uh, anybody who's watching is very fortunate to hear you. <laughs> I'm glad that you invited me. It's uh, These kinds of conversations are what I do. And yeah. so I'm glad that they now have a venue that maybe helps them matter. So... Well, it might be you and me watching, just so you know. <laughs> That's all right. That's it okay. Still, it was still a good conversation. You know what, Terry? Sometimes I'm on a stage with 5,000, yeah. and it's the one person who comes after me later who says, wow, that really hit home. And I, I feel like, you know what? I was there that day for that one person. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And it's okay. Sometimes just one line in a book or one video is for one person, and that's all right, too. So. Keep rocking. Uh, I will be looking forward to seeing you next. Hopefully, maybe LA. I'm not sure, but for sure. LA, yeah, we'll Maui. be there. Yeah. Okay. So, thank See you ya. so much. My Bye. Pleasure.